I'd like to begin by thanking Make Magazine and the Lit and Lose Festival for giving us the opportunity to host Julianne Herbert this evening. Make Literary Productions' fifth annual Lit and Lose Festival of Language, Literature, and Art themed assembly is an ambitious exchange between Mexico City and Chicago. It's taking place at over a dozen arts venues and universities throughout the city over the course of this week. Julianne is going to be involved in a number of these events, including offering master classes in both English and Spanish, as well as the live magazine show at the Museum of Contemporary Arts this Saturday. You can find more information about this and all the other festival events at litluz.org. That's L-I-T-L-U-Z.org. Highly recommend it. It's going to be great. Um, but tonight, he's here. Um, and after he reads, he'll be joined by Tim Kinsella, a musician, author, publisher, and occasional Roosevelt creative writing professor whose most recent novel is Let Go and Go On and On for a brief conversation. It's a particular pleasure to welcome Julian Herbert as his first book to be translated into English, the novel Tomb Song, is one of my favorite books of the year. I read it on vacation this summer, which might seem like a strange choice because it concerns the coming of age of a writer slash musician slash teacher who shares a lot of biographical details with Julian Herbert as he attends to his mother who worked as a prostitute for most of his child and is dying of leukemia. But the book's formal inventiveness, its blurring of genre lines, its ferocious energy, and impressive tonal rage, range from rage to despair to sudden tenderness makes it a uniquely life-affirming book. The whole time I was reading it, I was thinking about, you guys know the, the trend in autofiction? And I was reading it and thinking, like, this guy has totally reinvented autofiction only a few years after it was you know, brought to prominence. But the thing is, is that it was originally published in Mexico in 2011, which means you just separately in invented your own tradition. Uh, um, Julian Herbert was born in Acapulco in 1971. He is a writer, musician, and teacher. In addition to Tomb Song, he is the author of several poetry collections, a story collection, and a book of reportage. He lives in Saltillo, Mexico. Join me in welcoming him. Hi, um, I'm very nervous. <laughs> uh, I hope my English is good enough for this this talk. Um, I'm gonna try to talk a little less and read a little more. Um, I'm gonna beginning uh, reading um, a fragment from from Tom Song, this novel that you already know more or less what is what is it about and well I'm gonna try to read uh, a fragment from this uh, marvelous uh, translation by Christina McSweeney. I haven't read it in uh, out loud in uh, so I hope I I, I can read myself in English, but I don't promise anything. I don't have much experience of death. I guess this could eventually become a logistical problem. I should have rehearsed it with some junky friend or grandmother with heart problems, but no, I'm sorry. There's been a gap in my education. If it happens, I'll make my debut in the major league, bearing mama. One day, I was playing guitar at home when someone came to the gate. It was a neighbor. She was sobbing. Would you mind not playing your guitar? Kukin was knocked down by a Coca-Cola truck. It killed him. We we're holding the visual right now. I was 15 and loud. I extended them the courtesy of keeping quiet. Instead of playing, I got my Walkman and put on Born in the USA. After a while, they came back and rang more insistently. It was my namesake, the neighbor's son, brother of the dead boy. He said, Come with me to buy some eyes. I put on a shirt. It was summer in the 116 degree heat of the Coahuila desert. You don't wear much indoors. I jumped over the railing and walked to the beer store with him. 
He explained. He's beginning to smell, but mom and dad are trying to ignore it. We bought four bags of eyes. On our way back, my namesake stopped, stopped on the corner and began to cry. I hugged him. We stood there like that for a while. Then we lifted the bags from the ground and I went to his house with him. Wails and cries were coming from inside. I helped him take the bags onto the porch, said goodbye, and returned it to my headphones. That episode is on my mind now because something similar happened the other night. I went out to buy water in the OXO store opposite the hospital. On my way back, I noticed a pedestrian making hard work of weaving through the traffic on the avenue. At some point, just before getting to where, he, where I was, he stopped between two cars. Horns were very soon honking. I deposited my bottles of water, went up to him and tugged him back to the sidewalk. As soon as he felt my hand, he slid both arms around my chest and began to cry. He was murmuring something about his little one. I wasn't sure if he was referring to his daughter or his wife. He asked if I could let him have a telephone card and I gave him mine. There's something repulsive in the embrace of a person crying for a loss of life. They grab hold of you like you're a slab of meat. I know nothing about death. I only know about mortification. In the last year of my adolescence, when I was 16, there was a second corpus in my neighborhood. And neither then did I have the courage to view the coffin because I feel, and this hasn't changed, I formed part of the unforeseeable chain of circumstances leading to the death. He was called David Duran Ramirez and was younger than me. He died one September day in 1987 at eight in the morning from a shot fired from a 22 caliber pistol. This tragedy was partly the reason for my family migrating to Saltillo, my decision to study literature, my choice of career, and eventually the fact that I was sitting in the leukemia ward narrating my mother's story. But to explain how David Durant's death marked my life, I have to begin earlier, several years before. This all happened in Ciudad Frontera, a town of some 30,000 inhabitants that had sprung up in, this, in the shadow of the steelworks in Monclova, Coahuila State, where my family experienced its most comfortable years, but also a catalog of humiliations. We've arrived there after the closure of the brothels in Lazaro Cárdenas, Mama went in search of sympathetic magic. She taught in that other city where a steel foundry was also under construction, our household would again experience the bonanza of the Lazaro Cárdenas tears. In the beginning, she wasn't wrong. In a brothel called Los Magueyes, she met Don Ernesto, an elderly local cattle rancher. He started frequenting her as just one more whore, but as the months passed, he began to realize my mother was no fool. She read a lot, had a rare talent for arithmetic, and crazy as it, as it, this may sound, was a woman of very firm principles. She was, above all, incorruptible when it came to other people's money something that, in my country, 
almost makes you a foreigner. Don Ernesto took her on took, took her on as his eyes and ears in a couple of business, another brothel and the town's gas station. He offered her a fair way wage and affectionate treatment, no one of which stopped him turning up from time to time, having had one tequila too many and putting his hand under her skirt, a maneuver she had to dodge without losing her job or her composure. Maricela Acosta was happy. She organized her children to look after one another so as not to squander more money on neurotic childminders. She rented a house with three bedrooms and a small yard, acquired some furniture and a dilapidated sky blue Ford. She brought humus rich soil from La Madrid and planted a small plot of carrots that never grew. The name of our neighborhood was Ominous, El Alacran, the scorpion. But however smutsy it may sound and will sound, what else can you expect from a story that takes place in the sweet nation? We live it on the corner of Progreso and Renacimiento at number 537. There, from 1980 to 1982, between progress and renaissance, we spent our infancy. My mother's and mine. Then came the massive devaluation of the peso, known as the dog crisis, after the president had promised he would defend the currency like a dog. And in my childhood, Pan Pantheon, Jose Lopez Portillo entered posterity, in my mother's words, the great son of a bitch. Don Ernesto's out of town business went bankrupt. He returned to his cattle and sacked Maricela. We held on to the house, but began making seasonal migrations again, Acapulco, Oaxaca, Sabinas, Laredo, Victoria, Miguel Aleman, Mama attempted to the umpteenth time to earn a living as a sewing machine operator in the taken banded assembly plant in Monterrey. The pay was so low it was criminal and she was hired at peace rate two or three shifts a week. She always ended up going back to the daytime brothels on Calle Villagran, squalid dives crammed by mid-morning with soldiers and cops more interested in the clothes than, than the woman, which added a tinge of violence and wretchedness to the air. It was soon impossible to keep up with the rent for the house. At the end of 83, we were evicted and all our possessions seized, almost all of them. At my express request, the clerk of court allowed me to remove a book or two before the police loaded our things onto the van. I, I took the two thickest, the complete works of Wilde in an Aguilar edition in volume 13 of the Nueva Encyclopedia Thematica. Literature has always been generous with me. If I had to go back to that moment, knowing what I know now, I choose the same books. We spent three years in absolute poverty. Mama had acquired a plot on disputed common land, but there was nothing there besides dwarf sand dunes, dead cacti, half a truckload of gravel, 300 blocks, and two sacks of cement. We erected a small room with no foundations that came more or less as high as my shoulders and added a roof of cardboard sheets. To get in, you had to go on all fours. There was no running water, no drains, no electricity. Jorge left high school and found a job 
mixing nixtamal in the tortilla section of an industrial canteen. Said and I sang on the buses for money. Mama, who by then had given birth to Diana, my little sister, was always away on trips. Within a year, Jorge has had enough. He grabbed some clothes and left. He was 17. We next received news of him on his 23rd birthday. He'd just been appointed duty manager at the Hotel Vidafel in Puerto Vallarta. He added in his letter that it was a seasonal post. I was born in Mexico by mistake, he once told me. But one of these days, I'm going to put that right once and for all. And he did. At the age of 30, he immigrated to Japan. I can't talk about my mother or myself without referring to this period, not for its sad, pathetic aspects, but because it's our version of spirituality, a hybrid between Buñuel's The Jung and The Damned and The Dhammapada, or better still and less run-of-the-mill, Pedro Infante's Nosotros los Pobres in mystic karate master costumes, the 36th chamber of Shaolin. Three years of dire poverty don't destroy you, just the reverse. They awaken a certain visceral lucidity. I'm gonna jump a little bit. I was in the first year of high school and despite the stigma of having been a beggar in the eyes of half the town, had slowly managed to renew my friendship with the Durands a fair-haired family of French descent that had little money, the father was a truck driver, and, and were very popular. One night, Gonzalo Durand asked me to go to La Acequia with him. He wanted to buy a pistol. Gonzalo was a sort of alpha male for us members of the street corner gang who met up in the evenings to smoke marijuana and flirt with the girls coming out of the high school. Not only was he the oldest, he was also the best fighter and the only one of us with, with a good job, an operator in the number five hot metal furnace at AMSA. He was just 19, the age of armed illusions. The elite chosen to accompany him on his right of passage were Adrian Contreras and me. We made our way in an unregistered 74 Maverick to the adjoining neighborhood. First, they offered him a Smith & Wesson revolver. Then they showed him the small automatic pistol. He fell in love with it straight off and bought it. The next day, Adrian Contreras came around and said, Something terrible happened. Gonzalo accidentally fired off a shot and killed El Guerillo in his sleep. The first image that came into my head was ominous. Gonzalo sleepwalking, peppering his family with bullets. But no, he'd come off the night shift and wide awake and impatient, gone straight home, climbed up into his bunk, and began to clean the pistol under the sheet. A bullet had somehow gotten into the chamber. Gonzalo, who knew nothing about firearms, hadn't even realized. At some point, the pistol slipped from his hands. Trying to grab it, he accidentally pulled the trigger. The projectile went through the bunk and hit his little brother sleeping below him in the belly. David Durand was, what, 14 years old? He'd once run away with his girlfriend. Presumably, he wanted to get married. Their parents gave them each a good trashing. He died in Gonzalo's arms on the seat of the Maverick on the way to the hospital. Adrian and I turned up at the burial service but didn't dare go into the chapel. 
We were afraid any moment someone would ask, but where did that bastard get hold of a pistol? Gonzalo was in prison for a couple of months. That was the last I heard of him. Mama, very serious, said, you'll regret, you'll regret it if I ever see you looking at fire, firearms or hanging around with those bloods on the landscape again. The rest of the year passed. One day, just before Christmas, Mama came home very early, still smelling of alcohol. Said, Diana, and I used to sleep huddled up together in the same bed to keep warm. Mama switched on the light, sat down beside us, and sprinkled out and sprinkled our heads with a shower of wrinkled bills. Her makeup was like a clown's, and there was a small red wound visible on her forehead. She said, let's go. And just like that, without packing or stripping the house down, we fled from the hometown of my childhood. Every so often, I go back to Monclova to give a lecture or as part of a book tour. Sometimes we drive around the edge of Ciudad Frontera on our way to the pools in Cuatro Cienegas or to gather pom grenades in Mabel and Mario's farm in La Madrid. I say to my wife, as we drive along the Carlos Salinas de Gortari bypass, I leave it behind that airport when I was a kid. She replies, let's go there. And I say, no. <laughs> Thank you. Just, I'm, I'm gonna take <laughs> one more minute. After, sorry, Jim. <laughs> uh, just because, um, I have the need to, to hear the sound of uh, Spanish. Uh, I, I wrote uh, this, this poem in, in, this, in this travel, so I'm going to read for the first time <laughs> a poem here in Spanish, uh, just, to, just for the rhythm, you know? <clears throat> and this, poem na this poem's name is Sakyamuni me llama por cobrar. Sakyamuni is one of the names of Buddha. And, and the, the, the title is Sakyamuni calls me by collect call. Sakyamuni me llama por cobrar. Hay suficiente oficio para matar estas palabras. Suficiente medusa, faraón y derrumbes bajo el agua. Una madre pasea trozos de mujer en la carreola. No excavarás la sombra. Hay tiempo todavía. La voluntad quema los ojos mientras pequeñas bestias descienden de los árboles y apalean a tus vacas. Habrá tiempo de ir al mercado con una lista de venenos. Estás expuesto a todo tipo de invasión. Tienes que amar el corazón de los comanches que te comes. Al menos come lo que matas. El guarismo en la torre, la torre que se alimenta de centinelas. Suficiente medusa, roca en las vendas. Polvo, habrá faraones dispersos, lesiones de tinieblas. No tengas miedo, cruza. Yo no soy ese mundo, soy apenas su orilla. Hay suficiente oficio para matar estas palabras. No te preocupes, hay suficiente oscuridad para mañana. Thank you. Let's do it, Tim. Thanks for reading the Spanish poem. It gives such a different uh, impression of, you know, you, you mentioned like feeling insecure reading in a second language. You did it, there was like zero problem, but it was really amazing to hear you read in Spanish and then be like, Thank oh, you. this is what you want to be able to do without the barrier. Yes, that's, that was the idea, of, of course, to, to, to make the, the rhythm of, of, of because, I, I cannot uh, imitate, you know, the, the the sound of the of the English in in, in Christina Maxuni. I I can I can notice that it's a very good translation, but I cannot read it quite well. But you, your English is good enough that you can read it and know that she did a great job. Yes, yes, I'm sure she did.
And so this was originally published in 2011? It was uh, originally published, yes, uh, at the end of 2011 uh, in, in Spanish. Yes, in, in. Uh, So, like, that's seven years ago, yeah, seven and years. there's, like, a big transformative life event at the center of this, and you're getting some success from the book. Do you feel like the same man that wrote that book? Like, when, when you read it, is he familiar to you? It's still familiar, but this kind of... It, for many reasons, is is different because uh, in the first place, uh, I have a lot of, of personal experience between the 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 book uh, the original original uh, no, the, origi the the original apparition of of the book, and now I have a uh, at least two big crises in mm. in my life. So uh, uh, yes, I feel very different. But I can see that scared boy. Is, I still, I uh, still can see that that scared boy. That scared boy. You're saying? Yeah. I mean, d does it feel like a? I mean, so you were 38 or so when you wrote it? Yes, I, I was. Uh, when I began, it was 2008. So I was yes, 37. And you look back at yourself as a 37-year-old, as a scared boy? <laughs> I'm always a scared boy. I'm a scared boy right now. <laughs> the lights are intense. Let me, yeah, let me yeah. do something. Because yeah, yeah. Some, something a scared, a scared boy should yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No, great. Um, how, uh, how has your relationship with your mother changed since publishing this? Uh, that's a good question because um, I think when when the book first uh, uh, appeared, um, I made a I organized a breakfast with my brothers and to to introduce the book for them because uh, you know for Mexican tradition to put this all out is. Uh, Quite uh, complicated, you know. You don't, you don't know. I, I didn't knew uh, how it's going to be the reaction of my of my brothers, my bro my brothers and my sister. And when we were in in the breakfast, um, my sisters looked at the book, and she smiled and she said, uh, "Mama, told you were you were writing this, you know? Because well, the the experience with with her is." She died. Excuse me. Say, say it again. The, the experience, the, 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 yeah. the, the direct experience with my with yeah. my mother is well. She died. Yeah. I'm sorry to ruin the end of the book for you, <laughs> but it's 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 in the title, you know. <laughs> and so, well, for for me, the, the maybe the the, exper the experience of of uh, write the, the the book was. Um, I I th I think a lot of uh, uh, like uh, this like, like a journalist about e everything I I write and and I was thinking I have to invent this character and I have um, this character I chain it to a bed and so I can interview her and ask her for everything I I didn't knew before so. The study of the of the character was um, very uh, emotionally intense, but but uh, like easy easier uh, in in the pragmatic way, you know. Dramatic in a dramatic in, in, way. In in the in the pragmatic way. Oh yeah, yeah. Like it's easier. I mean, I think about that with like uh, war photographers or something, yes. right? Like they can be in the war zone, but they have the camera as like a way of detaching themselves? Yes. So you were using the writing as a way to? I'm going to steal that metaphor from you, because <laughs> I do. think it's a very clever you way to say pay, it. Pay yes. PayPal me at my email. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um. But yeah, so that's what you mean. It was, so it was a way of getting through the? Yes, because, because yes, you're, you're right. Because it was, uh, I have to, I, I call him, um, for, for, uh, for the research was uh, very structured, and there was there was the the question of pain. But 
I was very busy with the other stuff with the with the material. So yeah. the, I I think I, I don't I think the aesthetic experience is always like that because uh, I have a friend, uh, a Mexican writer. Uh, the, the, he says he he, he practices uh, kickboxing, mm -hmm. and he he said about about uh, writing. He said, uh, "Do do have to to beat in the in the injury in the injury in the um, la lesión? ¿Cómo es cómo es lesión? Injury. injury. Do you, you have to 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 punch to punch?" To punch in the injury, punch so in, punch into it. Punch in, yes, so you you can defeat your rival. Just but in the case of of aesthetical process, the rival is yourself. Mm -hmm. So I, I I guess for me it's a a very uh, rash, rational process, but it's about pain always for me. Yeah, and so when you talk about the, um, I can't remember the word you used. Um, pragmatics of the writing of this? Do you mean like the actual written material or you mean like you, there's a comparison in the book to saying like uh, being at your mother's bedside felt like being in a political campaign, you know, and you're sort of like doling out people's responsibilities. Do you mean yeah, like the pragmatics of the hospital or the pragmatics of like uh, keeping the timelines organized? Uh, I, I, Cannot see the difference quite well <laughs> because I, I was thinking in, in a project, you know, mm -hmm. and so my my project was uh, have uh, had uh, like two aspects, you know. This is the project of my mother's illness, and this is my writing project, and these two things are happening together are the same. Stuff you know, I, I, and for me, it was it, it was very hard. I I I I'm, I don't I'm not trying to be cynical. Uh, um, what I mean is, when I was uh, writing this novel, in one moment I, I and it, it's it's written in the, in the novel. I I, I thought um, if my mother lives, I don't have a novel. There, there's a, the, the 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 material is pointing in one in just one direction, and it's about death. And if she lives, I have a mother, but I I don't have a novel. And in the opposite, if she dies, this could be a good novel. I I thought, I hope it, it's quite okay. Uh, <laughs> but that 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 thought is not cynical. For me, it, uh, I swear it's, it's not cynical. For me, it's, that's the things like the things are. Do you do you write every day? Do you depend on writing as like a way to process what's happening to you always, or was it an extreme event? It depends of the project. So that's I, no. <laughs> yes, that's no. No, because because when I was when I was writing this this novel, I was uh, going and and then. Uh, but you make, it, you make it sound like January 1st, I'm starting this novel. Oh, my mom's gone into the hospital today. Obviously, it didn't happen that way. You, no. You know, yeah. No, 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 because uh, I was, I, I began, well, the process, it's, it's as complex as the, the leukemia of my mother. Mm -hmm. Because uh, she get into the hospital in, in, in 2008, in October 2008, 10 years ago. Uh, so I was there, and I began to to write a novel uh, beside her bed. You know, I was there, and I the, the first part of the novel is is, is written there. Then uh, she get well, she go out to the hospital, and I left the book for like one year. I was doing other stuff, and then. She go back to the. She went went back to the hospital. So I go back with her, and I go back with the novel too. And then she dies, and then I wasn't. Um, I cannot write in that moment. 
<clears throat> so I have to, there's, there's a, uh, you, you have to, to buy it anyway, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> but, but I was, I was, um, um, I don't, I don't want, I don't want it to go on with the novel. It was too painful. Still is. <clears throat> so there's a, a large uh, passage in, in the novel that happens in Berlin, and another one that happens in in Havana, and that was me trying to run away. <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. So it's very difficult to speak about it, even in English. I didn't <laughs> notice until now. Uh, sorry, because because I have to to get into more. It's harder in English, I, I think, because I have to go to the basic emotion. Sorry. So um, when I was trying to 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 run away, the novel took that path too. And then in one moment I I say. It has, it has to end, you know? And does, so I, I go to a to, um, um, house in, in the field. Una casa de campo, como es? Yeah, a house in the field, uh, uh, that, that, uh, a house of, of a friend. And so I, I were there for two, two weeks, and I wrote the final uh, part of the novel. And then, of course, I have to read it all and try to make it more like a novel mm. and not just like a fracture. Yeah, were there, were there specific things, themes or events or anything that you knew you couldn't include? Like that, that would then determine, I'm not asking you to like name these things now, I'm, but I'm, I'm saying like, um, did that affect the course of, of how you wrote? And what what affects the course of, uh, that I was uh, that, that I wrote in general is if it's necessary to the to the plot or not for me or for the not even not not just for the plot for the aesthetic experience for me so when when something is too too hard or nasty or but but I think it has to be. He, on the on the record, I put it on the record, and when I uh, took the material off, it's just because I think it doesn't work mm -hmm. for the for the story for the for the novel as a novel, you yeah. know. For, I think when you jump into into uh, some some material, you have to do it all the way. You cannot. Uh, that's that's not uh, that that's not the way. We, we live in a book. I mean, like a, re like a reader, I cannot ask you for your time if I'm not, uh, I, that's the say in the novel too. Um, the only, you, can, you, you have, you, a writer has the permission to play with the reader's mind. But the condition is he has to be, uh, Will it to, to get insane if it's necessary. You have to do anything necessary to 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 to, to take the, the novel all the way. And if you do that, you can play with people's mind. Other otherwise, you don't have the right. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot what I was gonna. <laughs> so were you? Huh. Oh, can I ask one more question or two? Uh, did, were you surprised by the shape that the novel took, or like the course? Like you said, you had to go to your friend's house, and like there was an expectation in your mind of what a novel should be. But this isn't like the shape or structure any reader is going into a novel, because you know, because there's these moments where you follow it, and then you're like, "Oh, just kidding, that's not true," you know. And it's like <laughs> all these surprises. Was were there moments in crafting it where you were? Surprised by the shape it was taking and the course it was going. Most of the time, most, most of the, the time. time, I was. Yes, I was. But I, I think, I think this, uh, and, and you as a musician, 
uh, I'm sure you can relate with this. Uh, you have to to listen to them to the stuff. You have to listen yeah. to the material. So. Uh, it, it, it speaks to you. It's, yeah. it's like, a, like improvisation. If you are ready, if you study enough, if you are uh, prepared to, you, you don't have to, like um, for this, for example, for, to, for me being, being here is, is very, it was very difficult before the first moment I, I began to, to talk with you guys. Uh, and the moment I began, it, w it was easy because I, I, I got the energy, I can see you, I can see your eyes, I can, because I sing in a band too, so you can, you can took that, that material and you can incorporate to, to the process. So it's surprising, but you're ready for the surprise. Yeah. So I, the think, su I think that's the process. Yeah, the surprise is energized you. They didn't yes. scare you. Yeah. Yes, yes, because I try to, to, to be uh, prepared before. Yes, you know, when, when that, that story, uh, you make a lot of practice. You make you made a lot of practice, and then you, when you get there, yes, it's surprising, but but it's not not scary, right. not right. not too uh, scary. Uh, so we'll open it to questions. I'll put this microphone back here. So, in general, like as an educator, what do you feel like is the greatest advice um, that you've learned about educating, as well as like what is the best? advice you can give that um, to a teacher you mean um, or either to <clears throat> both as like to a teacher and then as uh, to writers okay it's a very difficult question because i, I don't i don't think well, well i well, well, maybe i could say don't listen just one advice <laughs> maybe it's, it's a, a possible way because i think there are many many things you can use i i do sell a lot of, of phrases of um, quans, I, I say it, uh, quans, uh, um, with, with when when I'm working with with one one of the one of those is I, I just said uh, be ready for the improvisation. Um, what do you think Hemingway will do? That's, that's it, an easy one. <laughs> Hemingway works for me. I don't know for you, but but you have to to some. Do you have do you have a do you know do you have your your reality show um, judge? Everyone has one reality show uh, judge, you know, and, and he's gonna tell you you're out. So do you have to know? That judge, that's in your mind, maybe is, uh, I don't know, maybe for me it's Hemingway, but you can say any name you like, no? Monet, or I don't know, Beethoven, Steve, Steve Reich, I don't know. Uh, but you have to, I think you have to, to think that, who, what, are you nominated for him, or for her? I, I think that's a good question too. I can use the rest of the time singing. <laughs> no, seriously, you can you can do it too. <laughs> um, could you speak a little bit about uh, the work that you've made since Tomb Song? Um, you've re read a poem for us, but I wonder if, after writing a book that was so rooted in your reality, um, did did you stay there, or have you returned to total fiction, or how has it gone for you? Yes, that's that's a good one. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, sure, sure, sure. Um, that's a good one. Uh, what I what I what I did uh, after Tom Song. Um, well, first uh, um, I I used to to write poems most of the time. I wasn't ready for uh, what happened with this novel. I live in a small city in the northeast of Mexico. Um, I wasn't ready for what happened. In, and it was great. I am in Chicago. <laughs> and, uh, but it was um, very difficult for me uh, because um, as uh, cliche it sounds, I wasn't ready for some kind of success. So 
I have uh, rough years, uh, I have a uh, divorce, uh, I have to stay in a pre-psychiatric clinic. So that's one of the wor works I have to do, deal with it, you know? And that for me is a very uh, deep job. And then, th then there are the books. I have a son, and when, when my mother dies, that's two in the novel. That's, that's the problem with autobiographical stuff, that you talk about that all the time, so nobody buys the books. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a son, Leonardo, and when Leonardo begin, begin to, to um, to talk, I, I for some years I couldn't uh, I couldn't write poems because the poet the poetic experience for me was to teach him to to talk you know so for like four years I didn't write any poem um, now I'm going back back in the horse I hope it works I don't know. Yet, uh, I, after the, I, I, I was trying to do some uh, cro the chronica. I don't know how to translate the, the, the concept. It's like a chronicle, but yeah, it's kind of like creative nonfiction, but it's like like creative nonfiction. Creative nonfiction, yeah. So it's literary, literary style writing with popular culture. Yes, I, w I was trying to do this uh, kind of material for magazines. So I was working, uh, interviewing rock bands and uh, that kind of stuff. And then I knew about a uh, massacre in a city near to mine in 1911, of uh, a massacre of Chinese people in this, in Torreón is the name of the city. And I knew the story about uh, I, I knew about the story for uh, taxi drivers. They talk a lot about this this story. So I was trying to make a, like a reportage. It's, it's reportages like see, uh, like a reportage for about this this stuff with the massacre story narrated by taxi drivers. And for me, at the, uh, the beginning, it was uh, like a funny stuff, but there's now I know there's nothing funny about massacres and racism. <laughs> so I learned a lot about this very tragic story, and I wrote a book that is a kind of nonfiction novel. Um, it's like 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 yes, creative nonfiction. Book. I, in, in Spanish, we have this word, uh, crónica, um, and the book, the book name is, is now with with um, uh, Greyhound, uh, Grey Wolf Press is going to publish it next year. It's uh, La Casa del Dolor Ajeno, uh, the house of other people's pain, um, and it's uh, about this this. Terrible story about a massacre in the, in the Mexican Revolution, in the middle, in the, in the beginning of the Mexican Revolution. I wrote that, and then I think I, that's too much tragedy to to near each other. So I wrote a, a book of short stories, uh, more like a homage in, uh, to to movies. Uh, it's like. A, a uh, parodic uh, lecture of um, uh, a parodic reading of uh, like um, movie directors like um, Scorsese or Quentin Tarantino, and this is this is already published last year in Spanish and it's going to be published in in English in about one more year. It's uh, the name of the book is. Uh, bring me the hate of Quentin Tarantino, <laughs> and that's that's what I'm doing now. Quite. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you all for coming out. Um, reminder that the other events in the festival can be found at litluz.org, L-I-T-L-U-Z.org. And we have some schedules up. Oh, there are schedules in the back of the room, too, so grab one on the way out, but also grab a copy of Leon's book, which is available in the back of the room, too. And it doesn't matter if you know what happens in the end. It's a, it's a beautiful book. All right. <laughs> Thanks again.